Well, hello, people. It is not Jonah Goldberg, who is being shipped off, even as we speak, frozen in carbonite, to present himself to the people of New Hampshire. I don't know how his presidential uh, hopes will stand, uh, whether he can get Dean Phillips to debate him or not. I don't know. But I know this. I'm Chris Dyerwalt, and this is the remnant from the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. And I guess it would be an understatement to say that this is the time every four years where it's Easter and I'm the bunny. Uh, this is when uh, I, I have stopped briefly back in Washington, D.C. before I, too, go up to uh, New Hampshire after spending a week in Iowa. And we're sort of here at the moment uh, of what looks like it could be a very quick race. Uh, as of this recording, we are looking at what could be the shortest technically open presidential nominating process uh, for Republicans, certainly maybe in, in modern history, but certainly since 2000. And uh, what does it all mean? And how does this fit into larger uh, more meaningful, more important discussions about what human beings will actually do and the fate of our species and all of that. So who would you find that could uh, work high, uh, work low, uh, who has a broad range of interests and knowledge, who is up to date, up to speed? Well, you'd find Christine Rosen. That's who you'd find. Uh, she is my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute, though she is not in the building right now. She has uh, is keeping someone chained in her basement right now who is pledged to fix her water heater. Uh, you hear her on the commentary podcast. You read her in commentary. You read her everywhere. Um, I don't know uh, where last I have read Christine, but it is always smart. It is always thoughtful. It is always useful. And it is always great. Gracious. And what else could we expect from Christine Rosen? Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much. I, I feel like Jonah's kind of uh, entrusted the um, uh, responsible teenagers to take over his podcast for the day. So I, I feel like I really need to kind of bring my bring my A game and, and not curse or uh, cackle too much. So this is these are my goals. I think I think that compared to both Jonah and me, you are one of the most responsible people uh, possible in the situation. You compared to the two of us, you're basically you've all live in basically. Is, <laughs> oh, that's a compliment I will happily take. I yeah, would, I, 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 everyone I, wants to be like you all. So <laughs> right. If my water heater was broken, I would be boiling water on the stove and <laughs> doing it that way, uh, not being responsible and having a person come and fix it. Um, so the thing I want to start with is about people eating on airplanes. Um, and this is not, yes, we there's nothing worse about this. Yes. There's not, there's nothing worse, uh, than journalists complaining about traveling. I've heard so much from so many journalists about, uh, the travel was so terrible. You can't believe how terrible the travel was. It was so bad. Like, uh, like. You know, we're in the Idrang Valley uh, and, uh, you know, we were we were soldiers once and brave. Uh, it, getting to Iowa was not pleasant and it was really cold, but no big. And I I was fine and actually quite cheerful about the whole thing until on a flight on the flight on the way back. They were handing out snacks and one of the snacks was a huge bag of sweet potato potato chips. Mm -hmm. The bag was extraordinarily crinkly and the chips were shatteringly loud <laughs> and it was six in the morning and I watched the lips of this woman curl around each chip individually as she smashed it crotch, into <laughs> a thing. Now, I often complain about people talking too loud and snoring and making too much loud on the air, uh, too much loud noise on the airplane because I'm a, a bad person. And everybody tells me, oh, just settle down, put your ear pods in, blah, 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 blah. But I come to you for validation. <laughs> loud snacks are not the correct snacks for the airplane. Agree or disagree? I agree. And as you know, I mean, the, the, what what 
the listeners should understand is that I'm I also have a nickname which is uh, Quiet Car Karen uh, because oh, I nice. take the Amtrak. You know, I, I I ride Amtrak a lot, not as much as as uh, Lunch Pill Joe, but I I do ride Amtrak a lot. And uh, <laughs> old middle class Amtrak, Joe, that's what they called me. <laughs> that's right, Amtrak Joe. But when I'm on the Quiet Car, which is a very I, I like to either sleep or read or occasionally work on the Quiet Car. Um, and I will be the person who very politely with a, with a gracious smile gets up and gets right in your face if you start talking on a cell phone in the quiet car. So I, I'm very much a, I, I made myself the enforcer. So I do understand your pain, especially when it's early in the morning and you're trying to try and settle in. I will, I do think air travel and the whole epidemic of air rage we've seen since the pandemic is a, is a sign and people's general rudeness in travel is, is a worrisome sign about what's happened to civility in our country and does not vote well for how we're all going to uh, react to the upcoming election results. But um, yes, I, I do share your pain about loud snacks. Uh, I All I want is a device. I want the folks at the dispatch media to devise a device for me that when someone is playing something on their phone without their headphones in, that I can fry the circuitry of their phone. <laughs> I would buy as that. A, <laughs> as a remote control. And it's just happening everywhere. It's just everywhere. And sometimes it's even on airplanes. And uh, but in restaurants, places, people just they're just listening to. They're performing their life for you, Chris. You just have they're, to They're listening their to their TikToks. You know? <laughs> they're watching sports. They're doing it. And they have no headphones in. And I just wish I had a squirt gun so I could just <laughs> hose them down. Anyway. OK. Do the Republicans want to have a primary? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no. It doesn't seem like it. No. Some the, of the uh, Republican donors wanted a primary. Some of the people who disliked the Trump administration wanted a primary. But the Republican voter? No, it doesn't appear the Republican voter needs or wants a primary. Yeah. I, I, the, I was struck by, you know... I, I guess that turnout, so turnout in 2016 in Iowa was like 187,000 people for the Republican side. And I thought I was being very cheeky when I set for my model that the turnout would be 117,000. Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, that that'd would be pretty really. Close. It's pretty close. Well, it was. And I thought I was being provocative in doing that. And uh, looking to be a, have be a little bit of an outlier, no, I was right on the peg. And um, Donald Trump's fifty percent, fifty one percent, whatever the fine, wherever the 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 bubble lands, would only have been good for thirty percent eight years ago out of all the votes cast. And um, my takeaway is that yes, it was cold and the weather was bad. But I don't think they want this. I don't think they particularly want to do it. Um, I attribute this to Trump, the the power of inertia in politics. Um, for the same reason that we saw a bunch of people flirt with maybe going to mess with Joe Biden and what what might go on here. And RFK dipped his his weird muscly little toe into the water running as a Democrat and, and people got around it. the Democratic Party said, no, nah, we're, we're, we're not interested in that. I, it, it seems like Trump has most of the advantages of an incumbent. Well, part part of it that, that's striking to me. And again, I, I like to think about in 10 years, 20 years, what historians and political scientists will be saying about uh, about this primary he really was not doing that well and was not that popular and was annoying even, you know, except for the hardcore mega folks. A lot of people, until those indictments started raining down upon his head, like manna from heaven, uh, he really suddenly was once again in the position he really loves to be in when it comes to talking to voters. And that is aggrieved, angry, riled up, telling them they're out to get me and that means they're out to get you. And there's still, unfortunately, enough people in the GOP who caught into that message. Now, will they, will that in New Hampshire, is that going to be the case? Probably not in the same way as it was in Iowa. But I, I worry, I worry that, that that kind of grievance uh, messaging is still more powerful than anything that either DeSantis or Haley, who really are the only two left standing, uh, are offering 
to the base. They have to reach that base, even if they don't want to govern in the way that that base wants them to govern if they won. And I don't, neither one of them has really ever found a message that has has stuck since the summer, since Donald Trump kind of reemerged as, as the world's greatest supposed victim. Um, while you were talking, a New York Times news alert just came across that said that uh, the judge in the defamation suit against Donald Trump uh, threatened to throw him out of the courtroom uh, for making comments that the jury could hear. And Trump's response to the judge, I would love it. Uh, I would love it. (laughs) I would love it. And he would love it. He would love it. He would would. absolutely love that if this judge threw him out and he is the victim again and, and it's it's so bad and it's all that stuff. Okay, so I give Nikki Haley a five percent chance of becoming the Republican nominee. I think it's uh that's assuming uh, she wins New Hampshire or comes well that knows as, as of as today of as of today, today. with New Hampshire okay. with New Hampshire yet okay. to, yet to come okay um you're a boy mom so mm-hmm. I will hazard a sports analogy with you uh if you will indulge me go for it <laughs> which is uh Nikki Haley is down two touchdowns and there's mm-hmm. five minutes left to play in the game she has to score and she has to recover an onside kick and score again to tie it which is possible. Which is possible, which but sometimes happens. Yeah. It just usually doesn't. Right. Um, Ron DeSantis, uh, the uh, the new Ted Cruz, Nuevo Cruz, um, has a different set of motivations. It's it strikes me if Ron, if Ron DeSantis then there's a new uh, Boston Globe poll out today in New Hampshire that basically says, yeah, Chris Christie getting out of the race helped Nikki Haley. But Vivek Ramaswamy getting out of the race helped Donald Trump in New Hampshire. And the bleed off on Ron DeSantis is helping Donald Trump, too. And this poll has Trump basically at at 50 or 51 percent and Haley in the 30s. Um, The only way that Haley can win is if essentially... Um, the 275,000 independent voters eligible to to vote in New Hampshire do for her what they did for John McCain in 2000 and storm to the ballot box with no real Democratic contest, storm to the polling place and and try to stick it to Donald Trump. But of course, Donald Trump's now professional campaign has been working on that. And the way they've been working on that is running ads on MSNBC and on left-leaning sites reminding these people that Nikki Haley's quite conservative, that she wants to overhaul Social Security, that she is not – she's not it's – the, it's the Liz Cheney effect where Democrats are like, I really like that Liz Cheney. She's all right. She's, she's a good one. She has da-da-da-da-da. And they're like – Wait, she believes what? Yeah, she, she said had a what? Ninety-nine percent score from the conservatives. You know the way that we rank our our people rank their members. Yes, yes, she's yes. And whereas John McCain had the advantage with independence that he was a proudly apostate Republican. Right. Nikki Haley's just a and he still didn't win. I mean, he still didn't win the primary. I mean, he no, had this, but you know, but the, the he, there is he a thrash Bush though. Yeah, he showed that he he demonstrated a way that that if John McCain were from South Carolina, that <laughs> things might have right. turned out a little differently. But talk to me about the psychology of Ron DeSantis, the strategy of Ron DeSantis. Why does Ron DeSantis stay in? What's, what's, the, what's the upside for Ron DeSantis to stay in if he does? I mean, I think uh, as a Floridian, I'm always trying to get inside the mind of Ron DeSantis, a Floridian by birth, no longer by, uh, by residence. Uh, I... For one thing, first of all, uh, part of my answer comes directly cribbing from you because uh, you wrote that you wrote a great piece on the dispatch recently about Ron DeSantis looking beyond this election to 2028 and sort of 
looking at what's happened, understanding that he's unlikely to get this nomination this time around, but trying to hedge his bets going forward, which is smart. That's that's good political savvy. He should absolutely do that. Uh, the huge mistake with, you know, turning over so much of the messaging to the super PAC, I think that's that lesson is constantly learned over and over again. And thinking that he that his lane was I'm Trump, but not as crazy. I think that lane actually did. People are now saying that was just a terrible idea. I think it worked for a while, actually. It worked until the indictments and Trump Trump just reemerged uh, powerfully. I think people will look back on that message fondly if Trump wins the election because he is a lot more, I don't know if you've noticed Trump physically lately, is a little more rough around the edges, a little yep. less uh, polished than he used to be, a little less the the guy who made all these cameos and all these movies in the 80s. And I, I it struck me the last few times I've actually watched a video of him in, the, in recent weeks that he looked a little rough around the edges. DeSantis needs to find a path back to doing what he does best in Florida, uh, licking his wounds a little bit, but still being able to leave the stage with his dignity intact. And that's going to really require timing on his part and messaging when he exits. So, I mean, obviously he's staying in it for now. You would know better than I in terms of how candidates can do that with the most grace and the most uh, face saved. But he's obviously going to take a pretty good, uh, pretty, get a pretty bad showing in New Hampshire because he went straight to South Carolina after Iowa, and he's going to try to, you know, get some, I guess, anti Nikki Haley momentum going. But I don't see how he can make that exit uh, gracefully, and then he's going to have to have the choice about is he going to endorse Trump if Trump's the nominee? I oh, he's he going to endorse. Trump. Yeah, oh, he's he going to endorse Trump, yeah. and so is Nikki Haley. I heard Nikki Haley yeah. say. Uh, the other day, she was she was asked a question. I was uh, I was lurking in a diner in Iowa, and um, uh, the question was, "Well, many of your supporters say that they would vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump in a general election. What do you say?" She was right, right quick. I'd yeah. take Donald Trump over Joe Biden any day of the week. Yeah. So, um, I think Haley, the um, the and James by the way, K that's where most GOP voters are, too. I mean, yeah. even the ones who don't like Trump that much, they are still GOP voters. They're going to vote for the Republican. There's there's 25 percent of the Republican Party that's against Trump. Half of them will end up voting for Trump mm -hmm. if he's the nominee. Right. Half of them in a general election will say, well, I don't know, principles fine. be I'll damned. Oh, see, I curse. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think I think damnation is, is a, that's, I think that's fine. <laughs> I think, uh, um, but the mo half of them will will show up and and vote anyway. A lot of them won't. Um, but before we before we leap ahead to the general election, um, I find uh, Ron DeSantis. Um, you know, I'm always looking for historical analogs, and I see the James K. Polk. Uh, in Ron DeSantis. Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, was the revolutionary, but failed to get many things accomplished that were on the wish list of those populists. Polk was grim uh, and joyless. Check, check. Uh, and competent. Check, right? And I can definitely see if Trump uh, loses particularly, that DeSantis in four years, the, 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 the problem, of course, for DeSantis is if Trump wins, he basically needs, DeSantis would need to be in the Trump administration. He would need to be, he would need to be up in there because it's not like he can go be the president of Columbia like Ike or something and go cool but as that heels. That brings that being in that administration brings a huge brings amount of, of risk and uh, exposure to future legal uh, matters. One can only assume as that's what's happened to most of the people who served in the first so administration. The, the tr speaking of which, the Trump veep stakes is is in full flower. <laughs> Uh, right now. And uh, the supplicants have all come to Mar-a-Lago uh, and they are there. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Christy Nome and uh, the uh, I, I, I don't know where Elise Stefanik is right now, but wherever it is, it's not too far from a phone from which she can call Donald Trump and say, you did you did it again, sir. You you've done it again. Another another brilliant stroke. Um, but a name that has been circulating, and I've heard from multiple sources, is Ben Carson. 
Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, now to me, of course, this is just an insane, this is just a, a, yeah. a totally insane, if you're, if you're looking for, and Ben Carson is a very nice man, yes. but if you're looking for a person, the only person in America who could make Kamala Harris look ready on day one, uh, that would be Ben Carson. Um, and, but I think they're looking for somebody who's not a white man, somebody who is chill. Ben Carson is definitely chill. Uh, and somebody who can bring a sort of Pentian degree of servitude uh, to the to the office. So, uh, who should who who would be the correct choice for Donald Trump as a running mate? Oh, oh I hate these questions. I don't even like to think about them. Um, not Ben Carson. Um, I mean, I think he should pick a woman. He really should. Um, the GOP is going to get hammered on the abortion issue, regardless of who's at the top of the ticket, because that's that's uh, how the Biden campaign sees itself as having a path to victory, uh, particularly for those suburban swing voters, independent voters, younger voters. It's that that still is very much an important issue to them. So having a woman who can talk about that in a way that, quite frankly, Nikki Haley did pretty darn well on the campaign trail and in debate talking about abortion. She was the only person who was fairly honest about uh, the difficulty that that the country faces in terms of coming to some sort of national agreement on that matter, and particularly with Congress and the plausibility of any sort of federal legislation. See how I'm trying to run out the clock so I don't have to choose. Um, I, th I think Nikki. What are my I, options? Are there any other options? Well, besides the, what we've the chalk, right? The the correct answer. Mm. Uh, is Nikki Haley. Right, right. But I'm not sure she would. I don't think she would be wise to accept that job at all. Well, but people do be thirsty. Yeah. They, yeah, they do, do be true. thirsty. They they mm -hmm. they do. And, um, you know, if you look at the debris field around Trump, if you look at Mike Pence, you look at Bill Barr, you look at all of the people who saw that their ethics pushed to the to the tested to the breaking point who have have faced legal woes who have faced all of the all of the things um and trump broke them uh one of the things that i really admire about pence and the his his willingness to go run and ultimately his closing message being this is not a person who can who should ever be president again um, should be a, sort of a, a warning sign for all for these people like, hey, if you value your reputation, if you value who you are, don't put yourself uh, as my old daddy used to say, if you don't want to get a haircut, don't hang around the barbershop. Uh, and I think our, our Catholic brothers and sisters would call it a near occasion of sin. Um, don't. But it'd be awfully hard for Nikki Haley to resist. Well, I think I would, the bigger. I mean, it would imagine a debate between her and Kamala Harris. Oh, too. totally. That that would be worth it. I mean, I would say yes, do it just so that I could be a spectator in that sport. That would be. And it would too. heal. It would heal the wound with the mega base, and it would mm -hmm. it would do that for her. I don't know whether for Trump, Nikki Haley uh, is is. Servile enough. Right? Yeah, I was going to say he needs a passive number two. I mean, Pence played that role to a T, and I think it's why it was quite shocking to Trump when Pence finally, uh, while facing you know a, a group of angry Americans who'd broken into the Capitol to try to kill him, suddenly was like, "Well, I don't think this guy really does have my back." How surprising! And spoke out about it. I think that did shock Trump. Nikki Haley has strong opinions, and I think they worked together well when she was at the UN. But there's a lot in of New distance York. in New York, yes. <laughs> and, and New she York. had, and that was a much more autonomous position than being vice president is the worst job in the world. I mean, there's a reason that HBO's series Veep is continues to be like spot on worth watching. Still, uh, nope, that job is just absolutely thankless, and you need someone who understands it going in. Kamala Harris didn't understand that. Few people have understood what the role of that job is, embraced it, done it well, and moved. Moved along. Um, and I'm not sure Nikki Haley is the, has the temperament to do that job, quite frankly. Um, I there are two arguments, basically, that have been made against Trump inside the Republican Party. One is that you alluded to earlier, the DeSantian argument, which is Trump good, Trump old, Trump chaotic, new Trump needed, better Trump needed. Um, 
love you, but it's time, it's, it's time, it's time to turn the page. Then there's the other argument, which is the Pence argument, unfit, period. Person, this person cannot be returned to power, even if that, even if at the risk of Joe Biden becoming president again, this is a person who has, has broken the sacred bonds and has done something no president has ever done before. And it's disqualifying. There's a quarter of Republicans who like that. Um, the problem, of course, is for Nikki Haley. She wants their votes. And you see Chris Christie is like, I'll help you get them. I'll help you get them. But to get them, you have to burn your ships back to Magaland. You have to say the things. And so Haley, this is why she still has a chance, but it also speaks to her limitation, which is how do you keep those folks? And this is, you know, the basically the point. If you are a conservative in the Republican Party or you are a moderate in the Republican Party, you are very accustomed to dealing with populist insurgencies. Populist insurgencies, we can go back to Pat Buchanan. We could go back to um, uh, 700 Club. Uh, Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson. Uh, we can That's go back. <laughs> it's all the Pats. Um, a Protestant Pat and Pitchfork Pat. But the <laughs> you can go back for 50 years of sort of nationalistic, populistic, that energy, Rick Santorum, um, Mike Huckabee. So the conservatives have made common cause with the moderates to, against the populists, right? That's how you got George Bush. That's how you got Mitt Romney. That's how you got John McCain. That's how it happens, right? That's how you got Ronald Reagan basically, right? Like, okay, fine. We can do a deal. And only one time did the conservatives win, and that was with Reagan. But uh, this is the, that's the, the deal. Now, what you have, and this is what I conclude after Iowa, the populists have subsumed the party apparatus from the local level all the way up to the top, right? The, the insurgency has won. And when you look at Donald Trump's campaign, these are not, it's not Corey Lewandowski and a bunch of weirdos bebopping around. It's not Paul Manafort in an ostrich skin cape uh, tr making it up on the fly. They've got Chris LaCivita. They've got John Braybender. Uh, they've got Tony Fabrizio. These are like Bush alum, uh, serious, big time political strategists with uh, and consultants with great track records of success. Uh, and they're running this hard, tight game. So this puts conservatives and moderates in an interesting position, which is they're not used to being insurgents themselves. They, they've not done this before. They have not in, in the life, in, in anybody's lifetime that I can think of, has there been an, a moment where basically what was the, um, the John Stewart rally, um, the rally to restore sanity, something <laughs> like forgot. that. Yeah. Yeah. It had some very do good. Yeah. Name. And, and yes. Stephen Colbert had a competing right. rally that was like, you know, the, ra the rally for rage and darkness or whatever. <laughs> rally to restore sanity and or fear. Yes. The, yeah, the rally and to restore or, sanity yes. and, and, and or, or fear. fear. Thank you, guy. <laughs> um, and the rally to restore sanity is lame, right? It's right. hard to get people to say, we got to get out there. What are we going to do when we get there? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to be normal. responsibly. <laughs> That's right. We're going to be boring. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to do all. It's, it's hard to get people riled up for a, a, what is probably a lost cause uh, in the name of being boring. But there's, th there's something interesting, another flip. Uh, or challenge, I would say. So the populists have become the establishment of the GOP. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's that's an important point for people on the other side of the aisle, for Democrats to really take seriously, because this ongoing debate about is Trump a symptom or is he, you know, if you remove him, will the problem of all this populism and radicalism go away? No, it is now embedded. It is in the structure of the GOP at every level. So if the populists are the ones who are now the establishment, 
they have a real problem. And this problem started emerging in Trump's first term. Um, and that's that they don't have any intellectual scaffolding. They really do not. And you do need a little bit of that. Reagan was kind of a perfect example of someone who didn't need it to govern, but had behind him uh, at his disposal, both people who worked for him, a satellite group of intellectuals and a kind of philosophy that could draw on an intellectual tradition that could trace itself back to the founding, that could trace itself back to early debates among conservatives about what a country should do, what a government should do, the role of government, all these things. There is nothing like that in MAGA world. Now, that was argued, I think, by Trump and his most uh, loyal acolytes at the beginning as being a virtue. Like, look, we just we th we threw out the rule book. We're just going to do this on the fly. Occasionally, it produced results that I think people liked. Um, I think in foreign policy, there were some unbelievable things that happened that no one would have predicted. The Abraham Accords and the the willingness to say to Iran, you know, we're not we're not going in on these deals anymore. Those were two really important things that I think someone who wasn't uh, a Trump like populist outsider might not have done. But there was still no intellectual build coming out of any of that. And the, the intellectuals on the MAGA side who tried to create that still haven't found a very persuasive way to do it. So the the ideas uh, part of conservatism right now is really in disarray. Everybody's arguing with each other. Nobody knows who's going to come out on top. And now I know the average voter will roll their eyes and go, that's just those inside the beltway think tank types. And Scott, like, who cares about what they think? But ideas have consequences, and we're seeing the consequences of populist ideas right now in Trump and in the people who support him. Conservative ideas should used to have consequences and don't anymore, and I think we really need to start as conservatives or as moderates thinking about why that is and how to get those ideas back into the discussion. Now, obviously, I have skin in this game because I work at a think tank. You know, This is what we try to do. But there has been a, a lot of denial over the last decade or so among conservative intellectuals about this reality. Um, and that and the, the charges of elitism that are made against people like Nikki Haley, like, oh, she's an establishment person. She's a corporate chill. These things have resonance for a lot more GOP voters than I think conservatives want to acknowledge. And, and, and that's important for them to know going forward. If you're looking at someone like a DeSantis 2028 or, or some of our pipe dreams are more like, I want Mike Gallagher down the line. Like he's still young. He's, you know, but like when you look ahead to leadership, they are going to have to deal with the fallout of, of this uh, situation in 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. I, th I, 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 I very much agree. I think if you take uh, Josh Hawley uh, or mm -hmm. J.D. Vance as the example, exactly. right? Uh, Trump, if Trump loses in 2016, uh, or particularly if Trump loses the nomination in 2016, uh, and the uh, if if Marco Rubio, let's say, oh, we're going back in time. Okay, yeah. If you, if you go back in time and let's say Trump okay. had lost the nomination yeah. in 2016, and Marco okay. Rubio had become president. Mm -hmm. I think so there's so there's causal Trump, which is that ambitious people go where they think the votes are. And so they like, OK, um, I'm I'm cool with that. I'm I will reinvent myself over here uh, because um, politicians follow voters way more than voters pol follow politicians. And so the conclusion was this is the this is the avenue to success. So I'll go there. so there was a causal component. But I think it's much more what you say which is this energy is real and it's not going away and it's predicated on a couple things. One of them is an apocalyptic worldview, um, a sort of end times, uh, an eschatological republicanism um, that says the world is ending or at least America is ending. At least America is over uh, and it, it's all going down. And if it's all going down, who are we to stand around and quibble about James Madison's intent and what Federalist with the meaning of Federalist 10? Who are we to stand on these little things, given the stakes, given how stake, you know, the Flight 93 election uh, flummery? Um, so there's there's that part, which, by the way, uh, the media feeds constantly. It's like a constant, just huge heaping shovel loads uh, into the blast furnace of apocalypticism. Uh, so there's that part. And then there's the other part, which is 
negative partisanship demands very little of itself. Um, and it's very emotionally rewarding to those who engage. Very in it. emotionally rewarding. And the two, the the eschatological uh, obsession marries up very well with negative partisanship, which is the world is ending. It's their fault. All we have to do is try to stop them. All we have to do is try to stop them. And instead of saying, hey, Jack Kemp wrote this interesting piece that I think, da, 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 da. well, he's teaming up with Daniel Patrick Moynihan to, da, 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 to talk about this stuff, right? Like, oh, here's some interesting ideas on healthcare reform or what, what might we do? What's a, what's a conservative market-based solution that we could do? on Instead of that stuff, it's a lot easier just to say, if the other people win, the world will end. Therefore, the other people must not be allowed to win. In these focus groups I did in Iowa and all the time that I spent talking to folks out there, what was the thing about Trump that they liked the most? They liked that he was strong. He's a fighter. Yeah. they like Strong. Him, He's strong. He is virile. He is strong. He is powerful. He smashes his enemies in front of him. And Jonah, I love Jonah's joke. Uh, Trump isn't Hitler. Hitler could have gotten Obamacare repealed. Um, <laughs> but in their minds, right, and this goes back to your earlier point, when Trump is like, you can throw me, I'm not out of order. This court is, this whole court is out of order. The, um, that approach uh, lines up very well for that kind of apocalyptic negative partisanship. Can I throw a third potential uh, thing in there Do to it. the negative partisanship and the eschatological worldview, which I think are both correct? And that's at the same time that those were gaining power, they were leeching from something that this country has always been really good at, ridiculed mercilessly by far more sophisticated societies like the Europeans for for decades or for centuries, really. And that's our the amazing strength of our, uh, I mean, you, you can call it middle class. I would say it actually, since we're talking about some cultural trends too, middle brow. This country used to have this really strong middle brow tendency. And that was, you. yes, you know, all of the, the great, you know, the Morton, uh, the Adler stuff with the great books, like th there was a kind of expectation that elite ideas were existed, not just for the elite to, you know, uh, turn into policies that they would then scold the lower classes with, or to enjoy the benefits of themselves while denying it to others who would just feed on the lowest common cultural denominator. The idea was, these are ideas for everyone. The reason they've survived the test of time, the reason we still read these books, the reason we want to hear this great opera or this wonderful, uh, read this wonderful novel, is that they are good for everyone. They tell us something about the human story that we need to know. And the middle brow, although again, relentlessly mocked, had served a kind of, of purpose. It was a sort of leavening between populist uprising, radicals on either side, elite disdain for every, for the common man. And all those, you know, in different periods and different times in American history, we've seen that balance disturbed. What worries me going forward is that when you talk to people who are solidly middle class now, um, they don't, they are far more sympathetic to the radicalized notions of what's coming up from beneath than they are respectful of anything from what's coming from above. And that's because they feel like suckers. They feel like people who have done the right thing. They're making a good living. They pay their taxes. If they were immigrants, they came here legally and they want to be American. Like they follow all the rules. And those people used to be the sort of, and they don't really follow politics that much either. But politics, especially culture war politics over the last 20 to 30 years, has made it impossible for them not to play in the culture war. They're drafted constantly against their will. They're told things about what they believe and what they do in their ordinary lives that are meant to make them feel ashamed or racist or sexist. And this has just been building. And, and when you talk to people, and again, the, I have people, friends and family who are in this, this sort of vast middle, they will tell you like suddenly, and suddenly they have a lot more outlets online and, and whatnot. Um, where they can express this frustration and people listen and say, yeah, I feel that way too. And the answer might be what you said, burn it all down, or we just have to defeat the other guy. But they got there. There was a path that got them there. And my, and what I hope is that there's a way to restore some of that leavening that we need from the vast middle of people who are generally good citizens who don't follow politics in the kind of tribal culture war way that everybody seems to do now, and who just want 
good things for their families and for the country. I don't hear those people in on either side of the aisle much anymore. The amazing phenomena, phenomenon that uh, polling continues to bear out is that both the left and the right believe that they are losing. <laughs> yeah. They both believe that they are losing. I remember, do you remember when The Handmaiden's Tale had its Ugh. sensation? It was super popular. Not a fan of that book, I have to tell you. Just No, I, it's I not a good book. I mean, it's not that good. I I'm uh, this this is an apostate statement on the remnant, but sci-fi is kind of, you know, Okay, well, whatever. let's not go that far. Let's not go too far. <laughs> I like some got, sci-fi. It, it has its limits from dystopian, that's all I'll say. Fe- dystopian feminism is what you're what you're up against with that book. So yeah, yeah, Which, it, not just in that book. No, I kid, I kid. <laughs> uh, the um, but when The Handmaid's Tale had its um, had its vogue, and uh, women were marching on Washington wearing the the cowl or whatever right. and all that stuff, I thought. What? <laughs> what? You think that America is on the verge of becoming a theocracy? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? America is increasingly irreligious. Secular, yes, that's right. R- increasingly becoming a radical, radically secular, right? Um, and not just, you know, we we have the urban versus small town versus rural uh, divide, and our politics are very much city mice versus country mice. Uh, in a big, big way. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the leveling, the cultural leveling that has gone on. Uh, I'm a big fan of regional differences. Uh, and we've lost a lot of valuable regional differences and instead have have flattened things out into basically class differences um, that people of this educational attainment and this income level are this way, whether they are in Tuscaloosa or whether they're in Tridelphia or whether they're in Bakersfield, that it's just that they're, that it, it's, we've had a lot of leveling go on, uh, with the, with the steamrolling of regional differences. Um, but the, I, I think, the idea that America is on the verge of becoming a theocracy, whatever else it is, the idea that the America is on the verge of becoming a theocratic state, pretty far fetched. Um, so you have, but the people who think that are sincere, right? They believe that it's true. They believe that Mike Pence was going to send all the gay people to re-education camps, and it was at any moment this was going to happen. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. But then I go, I walk over to the other side of the street, and they say that you know the the, uh, the kids are being forced into, tra- and you're like, what? No, I don't think that's go. What are you talking about? And you can, of course, uh, the David Frenchian term, nut picking. You can always go find an example that says, see, here's what's going on in, you know, Wimberley, Texas. And it just proves what we're saying. This is just, this is absolutely true. Oh, yeah. Well, I found this thing uh, from Dothan, Alabama. And that proves what I'm saying. So we. It's like we, when you're having an argument with someone who usually it's in, in a romantic context and, you know, there's some sort of bitterness that's built up and then someone's just going to go wide with that argument. It's like, you didn't pick up your socks. It's like this. And you and they go wide. I feel like that's every, every, you know, post on Twitter X, whatever, or TikTok video that shows some extreme thing on either side everybody uses that as like let's go wide but this is happening everywhere this is everywhere it's the, really uh, just and, one dude <laughs> the, and, a, and a good rule in relationships of any kind of course is avoiding always and never exactly you always you never right uh and we don't do a very good job about that because we don't do a very good job of seeing humanity in people mm-hmm. who we disagree with well, because we're and, not even seeing them because they're most, right. mostly they're, you know, we're mediating it all through screens and there's no consequence for treating other people in this terrible way. And because of geographic sorting, we mm-hmm. live around people who mostly think like us, who mostly look like us, who mostly live like us. Except for those we, of us who live in D.C. for our sins. Well, that's well, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, we're you, 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 you and I, uh, I guess 
I guess I'll give you redneck status. Uh, I'm I'm a hillbilly. Yeah, um, I know the Florida Panhandle quite well. Thank you very much. And yeah, Central that, Florida. <laughs> yeah. So I think I, I'll give you I'll give you full redneck status. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I'm a hillbilly. Um, and there aren't a lot of rednecks or hillbillies uh, moving around in the, yeah. uh, Washington D.C. And I generally like that. Right. Yeah. I generally like that. I live in a weird, different place where I meet a lot of different kind of people from different places. And Same that's here. cool. But that's not the experience that most Americans have. That's true. Um, yeah. And what better way to resolve these differences than a general election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? <laughs> what better way to uh, ameliorate these concerns oh boy. and have a substantive, thoughtful, meaningful conversation about things that matter than to have the coot versus the crook uh, 2024. It's going to be great. I just feel I feel great about it. It really is the it really is like the the Iran Iraq war joke. Can they both lose? Like, isn't there a way for both of them to lose? Um, no, I mean, I think that the uh, one, one thing I, I one great thing about living in a, in a place as I do that is almost it's a one party town. It's Democratic Party. It's you know most people here are liberal to far liberal progressive, and a lot of them are my friends and I love them dearly. We there are certain things we don't talk about politically sometimes because it sets people off. But I generally have learned more than loathe the things that I've that I've heard uh, from my friends on the other side of the aisle, which is unusual. But 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 uh, they are a li- the bubble is real. I sent to a to a pretty progressive friend of mine the other day a meme that's been making its way around, you know, kind of the conservative world. You might have seen it about you know White House senior living. It's kind of a spoof video which shows some clips of Biden looking pretty frail and a little confused. And, and they I saw turn, that. You know, they turn it, it into a, yeah, it was funny. I mean, it's cruel, but it's funny. But it does capture a concern that many Americans have, not just Republicans, about Biden's ability to actually do the job separate from his politics. Send it to a very liberal friend of mine, and she's like. I don't know anyone who thinks that this is what, I mean, they just obviously, I mean, she had a million excuses and I said, like, look, I'm sending this to you not because I agree with it. I'm sending it to you to show you a lot of people think this is, a, I said, I think it's funny. A lot of people think it's funny, but it's funny because it's true. There's an aspect of this that is mocking something that is concerned to a lot of voters and that's his fitness, not his mental or political fitness, which is the concern with Trump, but his physical ability to continue to do this job. And, and that's something, I don't know how he engages that because he's getting older every day. And and I w- look at young voters. My sons will be able to vote in this presidential election. It's the first presidential election they'll be old enough to vote in. And they are, they're already deeply cynical. They're like, are these really our options? What is the matter with the generations before us? You guys need to clean up your mess. I'm like, I know. I know. It there is a generational. We are we, one of the many reasons why we are at such loose ends politically right now uh, is generational, yes. right? So yes, exactly. Um you you are younger than I am, but I'm Gen X. I am Gen generation. X. Yeah, see? And I don't think I'm that uh, much younger than you actually. My father was born in 1931. Mm. Lowest birth rate year in American history. And I was born in 1975. Not a bang up only year. 2 years older than me, so. Yeah. Not a bang up year. Uh, I just look 10 years older. Uh, Wait a not minute. A ba- I was born in 73, so you're younger than me, right? Well, you're w- yeah. you're wearing it very well, Christine. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're wearing it very well. Um, the uh, 1975 was not a bang up year no. for these United States. No, no, no. Yeah. If, if, the, if the most significant news event of the year of your birth is the United States pushing helicopters off of the deck of an aircraft carrier into the South China Sea as it <laughs> flees Vietnam, this is not yes. generally considered like uh, happy days are here Auspicious, again. Auspicious, yes. <laughs> right. So the silent generation, folks, of my dad's mm-hmm. generation and the Generation X folks like us mm-hmm. are the black keys in yeah. between. Right. Um, Boomers and millennials. Yep. The major drivers uh, are the boomers and the millennials. And basically the kids and their parents are having a big fight. They're having a (laughs) big fight about what to do. And there's a lot of anger in both directions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of frustration in both directions. And there's very little goodwill. And this is uh, to reinvoke you all. It falls to us 
in our little black key generation. And we are a small Gen X is quite a small generation compared to all the others. I mean, we're, we're going to have about 30 seconds in uh, <laughs> in terms of the historical timeline to do something right, which is basically to forge a new consensus, the consensus that was built out of the 60s. So in the year that I was born, a new consensus was being forged in the United States. And it was one that was between the greatest generation and their kids, the baby boomers. And that included Roe v. Wade. It included post-Watergate reforms. It, it included a whole bunch of stuff, civil rights. And it was a, a, a reckoning a, a, and a settling of affairs. People be, became exhausted of the conflict and a new consensus was crafted. Um, and now it is the, this very hard work of crafting a new consensus. My question for you is, is there a chance that a consequential, and I don't mean victorious, but a consequential minor party candidate will have an influence this cycle? Because if what, if what we're talking, Ross Perot was very consequential. Ross Perot balanced the federal budget. And he did it by convincing uh, Bill Clinton that there was a lot of meat on the bone over there and that when Bill Clinton needed a political reset, balancing the budget and uh, figuring out spending using the peace dividend correctly would work to his political advantage. Um, do you see a possibility for good or for ill of a consequential third party candidate? So who's on the ballot? Who got themselves on the ballot for this? I mean, the, who met the deadlines? Because that's the that's always the question, right? RFK is on some of the ballots, right? Well, RFK, there's there's one path for RFK, and that is that the homies in the Libertarian Party, right, convince him, and they they can to switch, yeah, form a union, yeah, uh, and that gets him on the ballot in most states, right? Okay. The Libertarians are on the ballot almost everywhere, right. So that could be very consequential. And then there's no labels. Right. Which we don't. Right. They are. They are, They have the infrastructure, but we don't know. There's no candidate that we that would yet and there, announce. So and that, there's going to be a super PAC that's right. going to try to be ready to help the candidate. But we don't know. Um, I but guess we won't the know easy until they pick till we know it's a Trump Biden race. That's when no labels has announced it will do something, supposedly. Well, yeah. they, they I, th I think they be I think they better start uh, firing up the old <laughs> yeah, copy right. machines. They better <laughs> they, they better get the coffee on. <laughs> um, t talk to us about that. Talk to us about whether that could be consequential. And, and just for uh, context, they have struggled with ballot access. There are mm -hmm. states where you can't get on the ballot until you have a candidate, and that right. has been limiting for them to a certain degree. Uh, I think they're I, I think they're over twenty now, and they're already on the ballot in a bunch of consequential states. So, what do you think? I mean, I think it could be consequential, assuming they can get on the ballot and they choose a ticket that is a true independent ticket. It's got to be a Democrat and a Republican, I assume, running together or two you know, people who are both so moderate that they cannot be tarred uh, with with being the bearers of bad policy on either side. That said, I think there are going to be a lot of voters. I mean, I consider myself one of these voters, uh, not that my vote matters in the District of Columbia, which it does not. But if it did, uh, my son's votes will matter wherever they're living, you know, in, in college next year. Uh, they don't like either alternative. You give them something that's a third party that is in, that's seemingly independent, that's separate from the mess of either the GOP or the Democrats, either Trump or Biden, and they might vote for it. And you don't need that many people to vote for it to really disrupt an election where, as, as you well know, a very small number of people in a very small number of places determine the last election and will likely determine this one. So as a spoiler, yes. As a uh, looking at this, some sort of broader brush uh, from a historical perspective, we are overdue for one of the two major parties to have some sort of serious implosion, reform, reemergence as something new. It's just time. It's been it's been more than a century. And maybe this is the beginning of that process. But I wouldn't predict which party it would be yet, is what I would say, um, because I think both have serious vulnerabilities. The Democrats, they don't like to talk about their vulnerabilities as much, but they have them long term. Um, and the Republicans obviously have have many that are that are now well known. Um, 
I personally would love to see a third party spoiler. I don't want it to be someone like RFK, though, who is actually like an expression of the country's id right now with its conspiracy theorizing and kind of off the wall uh, stuff. And weirdly, as a as a sort of child of this privileged political dynasty that went off the rails pretty quickly. So I I would not like it to be him. But if no labels can put up a put up a ticket that's reasonable, a lot of people want reasonable right now. All those people, a lot of people don't want to have to choose between Biden and Trump. Well, I've, you've really succeeded. We've really succeeded in cheering people up, Christine. I think what we've done here <laughs> is we've yes. we've we've lightened their hearts. We've lightened their loads. <laughs> Sending him off into the New Hampshire contest with just just glad like hearts. Like the guy they're chained just, to my radiator, they're just going to be happy for the rest of the day. They're just going to be happy. You're going to bring him a dish of water. Maybe you're gonna, it's we'll going to be. We'll see. That, yeah, well, we'll see whether he's making progress. We'll see That's whether right. we'll see we'll see whether or not the water's heating up. Um, <laughs> the last thing I want to ask is right now, as we talk, um, the debate in Washington is around a kind of a grand bargain. There's a lot of pieces. Uh, there's Ukraine funding, there's Israel funding, there's border security, and there's a continuing resolution to keep the government running. The safe bet in these circumstances, anytime bargains get grand, uh, is to say failure. Um, basically, the point that we've heard from the Speaker of the House is, well, we're not going to do anything until Donald Trump, until until the restoration, until Trump is restored, and then we will have what we want. Um, John Thune and Senate Republicans say, hey, dummies, uh, even if you got Trump, you'll lose all the Democrats. This is the, because Biden is so keen for Ukraine funding. We have a little window here. A bargaining chip here, yes. We have a little window here where because the House is a credible threat to block Ukraine funding, that we could actually get something done. And the odds of a border deal actually go down if Trump mm -hmm. were to win. Right. Um, am, I, am I assessing this? Is, is my skepticism about grand bargaining uh, well well founded? Yes, I mean, uh, look, Speaker Johnson also needs to sit down and put it. Remember when you learned to count and you would use your fingers? I think he needs to look at his fingers and count the size of his majority. It's very small. He he, and he's to his credit, he has not been. Um, he's been fairly modest when talking about possibilities, much more so than than uh, previous speakers. But he does not have a lot of room here. But he does have one thing on his side, and that's we saw this in exit exit polls from uh, the voters who voted for Trump in Iowa. We see it in general in the GOP electorate. We even starting to see it pretty strongly uh, expressed by some moderate Democratic voters. The border is a serious issue to Americans right now, and it is one that the Democratic elite has not taken seriously enough. So I think that he what he is, I assume, uh, thinking is that politically that's leverage for them, right? Like. You guys better do something because if you're not, you're going to lose in some key races where it where that starts to become a little over the top is is when we look at how how uh, his fractured coalition, his uh, lack of charisma and getting them all around the same table together. So, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and this is one of those moments where you want the, the new speaker to kind of listen to the to the Johns in, in the Senate, you know, Thune and like they, these guys know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a while and they actually have a broader uh, interest in mind of which uh, Speaker Johnson is part of. I know they don't have the same rabble rousers on on their right that he does. But yeah, I mean, they need they need to get something done. I mean, the idea that this country, with all of the other problems we're facing right now, still can't keep running like these shutdowns are very unpopular and the party in charge is the one that gets punished for them. So that'll be the Republicans in the House if, if this deal doesn't get struck. The for me, the simple answer is it would be very good for Joe Biden to get a deal done. Yes, on the it border, would. it would help yes. it would, if 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 Joe Biden Very presided much. over a border security deal, be really helpful. If he got Ukraine funding going, be real helpful. If he avoided a government shutdown, be helpful. All of those things would be helpful to Joe Biden. House Republicans know that and they are not going to let him have that. They would they would rather stick their face in the propeller and take uh, the short term pain on a shutdown rather than the long term win. Uh, yes, than, you're right. Then to hand than to hand Biden because Joe Biden, for all of his obvious infirmity, has had a better legislative. He Joe Biden has a better legislative record than Barack Obama. 
right? He, he's he, that bipartisan infrastructure deal, uh, the uh, coming to terms with Kevin McCarthy, avoiding this, blah, 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 blah. But uh, I don't think the House Republicans are going to let Joe Biden have an election year. He did it. I can't believe it. He forged a deal around all of these things. And so they will sit in the ashes and wait for the return of the king. They will they will wait for the for the rise of the orange sun uh, <laughs> and from uh, down down in Mar-a-Lago and, and wait for their moment, because we know that the the fundamental lie of negative partisanship is this. If we only hold out, we can have everything we want. We can we just a little bit longer, boys, just a little bit longer. We can have everything we want. Don't give in now. When in fact, if they would go back and read the original documents upon which this great country was founded, the principle is compromise, 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 compromise. Well, that's just Balance. what you say. So you get invited to Georgetown cocktail parties, Christine. That's <laughs> You're just saying that. I love that. I love that trope, too, because I actually live in Georgetown in a very teeny tiny house on a, on, on a block on the bad side of, the, of Georgetown because it's close to the university. Um, supposedly, that's the bad side. And the cocktail parties I go to are literally sitting in like a fold up, fold up chair in my friend's garden two doors down. <laughs> Like out, so with no outside. hot water, with no, no well, hot yeah. water, no hot water here. See, we really roughing it here in Georgetown. It's really roughing it. Well, <laughs> Christine, um, you are very generous to join us. Well, thanks and for I, having me. I very much enjoy all that you do. And I love being your colleague. It's just a wonderful thing. Likewise. OK, well, we'll see you on the other side. OK. And you people will see you. Well, I won't see you. Jonah will see you. Uh, he will return. Speaking of the return of the king, Jonah will be back for you people. Uh, and he will provide more raw excellence. Um, but uh, I have enjoyed getting to spend a little time uh, in your earbuds. Uh, so with that, uh, have a great day and we'll see you next time.